Bravo! Extreme rules. You thought I would forgive you? Just gave me a decent show to watch? Well, all I can give you is this. My time of watching nearly 15 years of wrestling has taught me this. WWE doesn't find surprises to keep you up, but it does find surprises to keep you disappointed. The rest of the show was decent. I had barely any complaints. Storyline-wise, logically-wise, there's a lot of misconstrued mistakes. First of all, Nakamura and Finn Balor had a decent match, but it's the same match as what they had on SmackDown that returns back in TV. Then... They just put the Intercontinental Championship on the line because Finn Balor hasn't defended the Intercontinental Championship since fucking Super Showdown against Bobby Lashley. And then just gets decimated twice in a row against Nakamura. Off a boom, from a King Shasha to the back of the head, then one right into the face after like a couple of decent strikes. That running, that running uh, first First ring rope. Fuck me. I didn't even know there was a game on. Fuck. Uh, first ring rope, uh, German suplex. Apologies. <laughs> Playing a bit of 2K. <laughs> Somehow didn't even notice that. And with that, uh, two Kinshasa's to end up with Nakamura's second singles championship since being in the main roster. I think this is a bit if and if since I haven't seen Nakamura in the main roster for quite a minute. I think been since, like, the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal back at WrestleMania, and Finn Balor hasn't been in TV for several weeks. He missed Stomping Grounds. The only pay-per-view that we've seen him perform was Super Showdown and Money in the Bank, and he hasn't defended the paper, it defended the Intercontinental Championship in pay-per-views that matter, except that one time in WrestleMania against Bobby Lashley, but other than that, no one cared over the, over the past couple weeks. But over the past couple months, the Intercontinental Championship has been... Irrelevant. Other than decent matches with Dolph Ziggler and Seth Rollins, Finn Balor holding the belt has been a complete waste of his potential. And maybe the same thing with Nakamura thinks he still can't do promos. He seems to be fumbling still on his wording. And I understand he's a foreigner. English is not his first language. I get that adapting to a different country would be uh, would be difficult for Shinsuke Nakamura. And he's only been in the U.S. for about... Two years, he started one, I think, uh, like, nearly a year and a half on uh, NXT since, like, 2016. And came up to the main roster, won the Intercontinental Champion. He won the U.S. title, the Royal Rumble the previous year, and did nothing with it. Except the uh, push against JJ Styles for the WWE Championship. And then just faced off against Finn Balor. And all we get from Nakamura is a couple notable low blows, insulting his own fucking language and his people of saying, I can't speak English, and proving that he's a great wrestler, just has treacherous ways how to make himself compelling to the eye in the main roster. And that's depressing enough to see both these dudes that came from New Japan and waste their talents as professional wrestlers, when obviously he was better at Chaos and Valor was better at Bullet Club. I don't know if they're willing to turn Finn Balor heel, but you'll hear about that in my Raw review that I'm uploading Wednesday, so I can just keep it consistent with Raw and SmackDown. The opening match of the show wasn't even the Balor match. I, I mean, the and uh, the next one was the Cruiserweight Championship, but no one cares. It was a decent catch wrestling match. Drew Gulak and Tony Nese were so good. It was just fast. It's just the same match. They were just the same one-on-one matches. They couldn't make it a ladder match to, you know, up the ante for something for Cruiserweight, something as extreme and lightweight as a ladder match, where these guys can do death-defying moves with things. Tony Nese isn't that much of a high flyer, and Drew Gulak is a lightweight technician. The match just stayed a regular sanctioned match where Drew Gulak retained it. Cruiserweight Championship. But everybody wanted to know what was the opening match of the show. The fucking... What could have been the fucking main event was The Undertaker coming to Extreme Rules. And what did we get? Eh? 
The Undertaker opened the show. Are you more disappointed than I was on Sunday? It, I mean, it happened. We got to see The Undertaker have a decent match and barely botch a move, except, like, when I thought he was going to fail picking up Shane McMahon, when it looked like he second-guessed it, like, oh, you're fat as fuck. And it, it was a few couple, couple moves, just Roman Reigns just saving the ass-kicking, Drew McIntyre thinking that he was about to hit the Claymore kick on The Undertaker, bloody bloody blah, 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 he hit the tombstone on Shane McMahon because he's a fucking midget. And they related this feud all because Shane McMahon failed an attempt to beat The Undertaker's streak a few years ago. It, it wasn't even a year ago or anything personal. Shane Undertaker did it literally as a hired gun for Vince McMahon. And if Shane lost, he didn't get to run Raw and SmackDown. Shane... Lost. He got the raw run raw and smackdown. So the point of that feud, just for Shane McMahon to jump off the cage and give the fans a reason to even buy the pay-per-view that wasn't even that good to begin with. And then he just brung that into relevancy, just for a reason for the Undertaker to compete. Is I had a wrestling match with you, McIntyre. What the fuck you got big for? And then, that's literally why this match even happened. Roman Reigns was just in it because he was in a feud with McIntyre and Rome and uh, Shane McMahon. I'm shocked that. Miz didn't team up with uh, with uh, the uh, with Roman Reigns, even though Ro when uh, Shane McMahon uh, when Vin Miz has more relevant beef with uh, Shane McMahon over, you know, attacking his father numerous of times since Fastlane to WrestleMania. So this this was I think like it was decent. Uh, but it was just a feel-good moment to just give Undertaker that W after that terrible display. What the fuck happened at Super Showdown? So, I'm gonna give it that. I'm gonna give it fucking that, because other than that, I have no reason to talk about this entire opening segment of the show. Because then... Fucking disappointment after disappointment even happened. Because, like, I, I'm i I'm sure I wanted to talk about uh, the decent match. The decent matches I've seen. Because there was Aleister Black versus Cesaro. And all because Aleister Black called out anybody that would pick a fight out with him, it would be Cesaro, the biggest workhorse in the goddamn business that never won the singles. Well, he did win the U.S. Championship, but I bet barely of you guys even remember when he held that belt. Whoever said 2013, you're retarded. It was a great match. Really great match. Tremendously well done. Fast pace. Numerous strikes. They tried to make Aleister Black feel like a vicious technical striker. I just thought that he would get more into his character. Like, they were trying to make it a little bit more gothic. Uh, you know you can make your characters character-driven and more strategic. Uh, but, you know, it's Cesaro and Aleister Black. The antithesis of an Indies match. And over that time, I wouldn't produce much. Except a better way of just Aleister Black having some jobber saying you have 200 guys on payroll, make them win those matches and have him face Cesaro that's the top guy in the company in mid-card standards. Then the Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss against Bailey in an incredibly forgettable match. <laughs> that proved otherwise uh, why the fuck is Bailey in? Uh, why the fuck is Bailey women's champion, and why in the hell Nikki Cross is still think she's relevant in any way, shape, or form? I swear to you, fucking hell. Over my time, I thought uh, Nikki Cross is just gonna be in her corner again, except this is gonna be Extreme Rules match. But it just came up with just reasons for Bailey to. Get a reversal, hit the belly to belly, win the match. I mean, with an elbow drop and win the match. 
There wasn't really that much to talk about. There was barely much storytelling. Or for a reason for Nikki Cross to even make it to 1 1 handicap if there was no, going to be barely any weapons involved. Then, the most disappointing match of the night, I felt like, second match, I'm not going from this to order because I already have Raw to do later. But, dude. Usos and Revival, they've wrestled so many times, I suspected them to be a bit more slicker in the ring. They flopped in so many times in Samoan drops, times they were in the top rope, off the side rope they were sloppy. This was a disappointing match, I suspected so much, but it came from a roll down from the Revival and it came up with a pinfall victory. I did not like this match, it was the most disappointing match of the night for me. Thinks that I think the Revival are not that interesting character-wise or gimmick-wise. Thinks they're just a retrofying tag team and have been for the same for the past three years they've been the company. And not once have shown that much of a character drive except Usi Hot. And that alone thinks he have been on Raw, but then they wrestle on SmackDown. And just get rid of the brand split. Please, I'm begging you. Then we had Samoa Joe against Kofi Kingston that I did not care about. Kofi Kingston was just playing the defensive most of the time, but he still went off a trouble in paradise. Off a decent muscle buster. This storyline accumulated over the past two weeks. That's Samoa Joe been feuding with Kofi Kingston, and this came up with just... A trouble in paradise from off the ropes, even though Kofi, the brutal part when uh, Kofi Kingston hit his fucking, got his fingers crushed on the steel stairs. It's like, oh, finally, we're actually going to see a change of pace. And Mojo's going to win the world title. We're, we're going to have a threat. No, we're not. It just came off a random trouble in paradise. A mid-card move, just hitting main guys from atop the hat. Kofi Kingston still not having trouble. He's still holding the WWE Championship, and they're going to be like, storyline-wise, oh, what an upset. Oh, Kofi Kingston tried so hard 11 years for this. Shut the fuck up. No one cares about Kofi Kingston as WWE Champion, especially coming from a nigger. I don't care. There's been a lot of other steps to deal with other than Kofi Kingston being the first black WWE Champion and his longevity in the company. Now, how long can the WWE... Kane and fucking Big Show been the company, double that, and they've barely got much respect. Well, except Kane. Big Show. But I just dealt with them more as, like, threatening heels, because of their character and their size in the company. And they've been a more interesting Kofi Kingston than... Oh! Remember when he feuded with Randy? Oh, shit! It's like it's like it's like saying that Evan Bourne was gonna go anywhere when he took that shooting star press RKO. Like, come on, you know that was a big segment for Randy Orton to get to get a huge pop for the crowd, right? That's stupid. It's like Shelton Benjamin against Shawn Michaels. You bring that super kick really hyping J uh, Shelton Benjamin to the main event scene. Come on. Then we had. The triple threat tag team that was Heavy Machinery against New Day against uh, fucking Green Day. <laughs> no, it was it was Rowan and Daniel Bryan in a decent match. Couple of big slams that spear from the mid rope, fast pace. It was pretty good. I felt like giving the New Day the title would just be a cheap pop thanks we barely had that many title changes with already Nakamura being Intercontinental Champion that just splits out of nowhere that could kick off so that really devalues the Intercontinental Championship and the two top guys that you signed under five years ago and still aren't over to this day and you just give the New Day the tag team titles because you think oh because they get the most screen time means they're going to make the tag team championships relevant. I don't care. I don't know why they just made it a feel-good moment. I felt like if you just gave it to Heavy Machinery, make them lose it to the New Day come SummerSlam. I thought that would push up something. 
Plus, it's in a bigger setting. And nobody cares about the New Day winning the Tag Team Championships. That was just a forced feel-good moment because Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan barely do much, and they barely have that many that much chemistry except Rowan lifting people and Daniel Bryan trying to have workhorse matches with people his size. So other than that, I can say how it is. I do not care about the tag team title match. It was decent. I saw stuff destroyed. It was all right. Then... The main event. And shout out to my guys from Wrestling Observer. Vinny. And Brian. Brian and Vinny. They also uh, have talks and have work for Dave Meltzer. They talked about this being typical WWE. And I even heard a complaint of Brian Alvarez talking about Monday Night Raw be going into WCW 2000 tele uh, territory. And it's like, that sounds like a bit of a stretch, but how can you blame him? Desperation to just change the belt whenever I can? The Universal title is already irrelevant. And this came, and the belt came out in 2016. There's been several champions, and not one of them has been memorable for shit. Finn Balor, out for a, sol a shoulder injury for a majority of the year and barely even had a day with the belt. Then, it went to Kevin Owens. He was only relevant because of his chemistry with Chris Jericho. Other than that, he just kept wrestling against Roman Reigns and Seth Rollins and barely pushed himself as a main threat. And just went back to the mid-card when he started feuding with Jericho. So that didn't push anything. Then, it went to fucking Brock Lesnar, to Goldberg. And it was just a reason for Brock Lesnar to get a win, because we need Brock Lesnar to still push this, the real monster, other than the real monsters that we are pushing, and still give it to Brock Lesnar, because we need a relevant mouthpiece, and we need an actual threat other than Braun Strowman and Samoa Joe. We push them as guys to be threat threats in the company. What the fuck? A guy like Drew McIntyre is not a real factor. Or Roman Reigns. So give him... Brock Lesnar with the belt for the first time was just a reason to give a guy that sort of works for the company, even though he's just collecting checks and just wrestling like UFC scheduled matches. And then we gave it to Roman. And then back to fucking Lesnar that held it for about like two years, two and a half, like a half a year, a year and a half. Then we gave it to Rollins. He was only relevant because he was dating another wrestler. And then... Oh, God. Roman Reigns had it for a second time, then the leukemia shit. It's like, everything with bad luck happens with the belt. Nobody gets over. There's never an iconic segment except the people that they're working with. And other than that, there's no character shift. Roman Reigns still calls himself the guy. Kevin Owens is still struggling in fucking mid-card purgatory. Brock Lesnar is still annoying-ass Brock Lesnar. Except now we have, we have him forcibly win money in the bank. Have him forcibly just get himself, be a nigga while he's down, while he's Brock Lesnar. And then just win the Universal Championship after a grueling Extreme Rules match. Well, the best part of the match was fucking Becky Lynch getting an end of days. Are you serious? Why would I even waste my time with this pay-per-view? Because all it was was hits, hits, hits. Oh, my girl gets hit. Fuck off. Fuck off. Fuck off. Brock Lesnar comes. Oh, shit. F5. Chair. Fuck off. The stage didn't even change. You couldn't even put the huge-ass X Titantron to just make it look like, oh, this looks cool. There was barely any segments. Two of the big matches on the card were fucking tag team matches. I forgot to talk about the Lesnar, uh, the Lashley and Strowman match because it wasn't much except Lashley just getting his ass kicked and a few strikes coming from Strowman. Yes, it was cool seeing them battle acro across the crowd and then the huge power slam outside hitting through the stage and just Strowman stands out victorious and wins the... Last man standing. Strowman, uh, Lashley was going to lose regardless. 
because they have nothing for him. He's been losing ever since Finn Balor. He's been losing ever since Roman Reigns. And you know what happens? Everything else, he barely wins a match. He never even won the minuscule little challenges that they did. And they were literally wrestling for no reason. For for So for Lashley even trying to get in a match that didn't add anything at all, Lashley just thought it was a blood feud because he speared him when... Uh, through the wrestling, through, through the raw stage, even though they had a 50-50 chance of both of them maybe ending up in a hospital, and then they took it like this last man standing match. Fuck this nigga! Even though we've only been fighting for like several weeks, and they randomly booked Lashley and Strowman back at Super Showdown, so that gave me an obligation that I should wrestle against him on the next pay per view. This show wasn't that bad. I'll give it a 4 or 5 out of 10. Extreme Rules was decent. The Last Man Standing match was entertaining. The main event was scuffed until the late, later end of it. And then, Lash, then Lesnar came and just ruined my hopes and dreams. Of at least something positive happening. And just thinking that La that Lesnar is a legit star, so they still have to give him the belt for the for the legit pay-per-view like SummerSlam to see if Lesnar's going to get over, if somebody's going to get over, and maybe win when we have four weeks. Oh, you can't wait for my Raw pay-per-view. I've got something for you. This was just a terrifying show to watch. It's sad when you have to see a legend like The Undertaker that did way too much for this business. Wrestle in your opening match of the pay-per-view. The two uh, two versus one handicap match didn't prove much or didn't tell a story. So did in the last man standing match when these guys literally killed each other in a match that was just false count anywhere. Other than the last man standing match. The Intercontinental title... A championship that's at least second prestige to the fucking WWE championship as being the most, you know, iconic and the most important. It's played so poorly, they put it in the kickoff show with two of their top signings. Their top guys, former NXT champions. You, you want me to talk positive? I say fuck Raw. I mean, fuck Extreme Rules. I, I will say fuck Raw later. Because they think it's that simple. To just... Talk about... What the fuck was Extreme Rules? It, it, I mean, logically there were some good matches. Ricochet and AJ Styles also had a good match. Uh, inverted tilt a roll into a, a reverse neck breaker. That cool ass Inzaguri, a shining with form, good wrestling, but doesn't tell a story. Other than the two good wrestling matches I've seen that were both one on one, then it, yeah, last man standing match. Two of your big matches that were supposed to be your main draws were tag team. And both were just using a kendo stick and a steel chair. And your pay-per-view is called Extreme Rules, and we only saw one table being fucking broken. What's that supposed to say, say about your creativity? And then you give Lesnar the belt at the main event? What is this supposed to say about your ratings and otherwise? Because you might be taking me as a bitching fan. Or just a hater inexperienced in the business when I've been literally watching you guys for nearly a decade, and I have respect for every wrestler in the card. Hell, I even watch outside their craft. So what is that supposed to tell you? I don't know if anybody's going to insult me over the comment section. I don't mind it. Do whatever you want. It's your words. I'm not going to block you. I'm not going to disable the comment section. But you know you can't complain about me ranting about The Undertaker opening a pay-per-view. The Usos having a sloppy match against the Revival. They're literally the best wrestlers in the show. In the in the, in the roster. 
Something like the 24-7 championship wasn't even on the pay-per-view. A freelance title that any person from any brand can get. Not even one stipulation. Not one creative thing they can do for it when literally anybody can get it. Alexa Bliss just gets a two out, two out of uh, uh, just a random match, a, a handicap match, and still loses against Bailey, just so we can overshove Bailey with a sloppy match that Nikki Cross can't work because she's a sloppy wrestler. Ron Strowman, of course, getting over because Lashley barely won anything since he came back. This just gets a 4 out of 10. I don't want to talk about the rest of this. Thank, thank you for watching. Raw and SmackDown reviews will be coming soon. Thank you, everybody. Like, comment, and subscribe. Mainly comment, because whenever you comment, it improves whatever I want to do. And it's always great to hear your opinion. Thank you for watching.